for the morning session is Dr. Foster from the University of Texas at Austin. Okay, thank you. Uh, don't worry, it's just me and 120 slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually thankful to this. So I'm giving this talk, uh, periodic modeling of large deformation ductal fracture, uh, which is largely based on the dissertation uh, from my student, Masu, who's, who's here. He's sitting right there. Uh, wait, raise your hand, Masu. So he's also offering a, a poster this afternoon uh, on some of this work, so you can, you can, if you don't like my answers to the questions, you can challenge him later. Uh, he's now at Brown University working with uh, Yuri Bozilov uh, as a postdoc. Many of us know Yuri. So I'm going to just outline my talk real quick. I'm going to introduce you to the San Diego Fracture Challenges, if you haven't heard of them, that we use this largely as motivation for developing some of the models in, in this work. I'll talk about some of the kind of state-of-the-art of the so-called correspondence modeling and paradynamics, uh, a new model that we're proposing, and then uh, revisiting some of our work on the San Diego Fracture Challenge 3. So if you haven't heard of the San Diego Fracture Challenges, uh, what they are is uh, the first one was issued in 2012, and to me this is kind of like the numbering of the Star Wars movies, because there were actually three challenges, you know, prequels, that were internal. Uh, I worked at San Diego from uh, for seven years before uh, going to academia, and so I participated in all three of those internal challenges, meaning internal meaning uh, just within San Diego, we worked on three challenges. And then in 2012, we decided to open this up. Uh, so basically, there was a set of experiments done. These were focused on ductal fracture. I think this first one was uh, 304L. So take a well-known material uh, with some unique geometry. Uh, in this case, it was a uh, what looks like a combat tension specimen for doing uh, fracture toughness testing, although uh, it had a blunt notch and then three holes. And then there, the challenge was to predict the overall load displacement curves as well as the crack path amongst the holes, the crack initiation, the crack path, other things. Um, the, the, the results of these experiments were with help. So this is a true prediction, blind prediction. There was a, a set of calibration experiments that were done that was released publicly with the challenges, uh, you know, the information about the specimen geometry and other things. And then the, the actual results of the, of the challenge geometry uh, was withheld until after all predictions were submitted. And in the, in the end, and there were, I don't know, 12 teams or so um, from, from various, uh, you know, prestigious universities all asked to submit their predictions, again, true predictions. And this is the results. So the light gray lines, there were the results of the experiments. There was some scattering in the experiments. And all of those other colored lines are the results from the best scientists uh, at the most prestigious universities using the most advanced models. Pretty good, right? <laughs> no, pretty bad in most cases. Um, but again, this is the difficulty of doing a true prediction versus the calibrations. There was a city factor challenge too. Uh, it was uh, similar in some respects. Uh, different, uh, you know, all of these challenges took lessons learned from previous ones and applied them to try to make them easier. Uh, again, there, this uh, black line is the result of the experiment and, and all the other predictions. Right? These these plots came directly from the uh, papers that were written after the challenges were over. Again, showing you know. The, the blind prediction results. So in 2017, they were getting ready to, or they did issue a third San Diego Fracture Challenge. This was on an additively manufactured specimen. So uh, the interesting thing about the additively manufactured specimens, you can build things, you know, they're 3D printed, right? So they, you can build structures that have sort of internal geometries and other things that you can't machine. Uh, of course, you do have a lot of variability in, in the geometry and other things. They did, they did a whole series of uh, 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 tests. So, so these were some tensile specimens. So everything was built at the same time. Right? So these were tensile specimens laid up in both the longitudinal and axial directions so that you could test the anisotropy. Uh, some notch tensile specimens. Notch tensile test specimens. Uh, these were all the calibration geometries. And then these were the internal, the ones with the internal features were the actual, where we were asked to do the predictions. And so, uh, you know, this, you can see it was kind of internal cavities and holes. And 
you're at the, the quantities of interest for these predictions were the surface strains at multiple locations and along different lines. And of course, the, the, load, the overall load displacement curve and uh, the fracture path, okay? So this is Sandia Fracture Challenge 3, which we <laughs> have over the years made some advancements in what we, or what we thought were advancements in constituent modeling, and so we wanted to test those out in this challenge. We had some introductions to paradynamics this morning, so I won't go over that. This is an image of a, a, a rigid ball on a glass plate uh, that was generated by the open source code of Paradigm, which has been in development for about 10 a decade now. We've done a lot of development uh, out of my research group, and the work that we're going to present today was done you know, within uh, Paradigm. So it was a nice introduction this morning, or uh, Dr. Medensi talked about this deformation gradient, this idea that you can take the collective deformation within the horizon and, and, and develop this. What this is is actually moving these squared approximation to the deformation. Um, first of all, we're moving these squared approximation to the deformation. Um, however, he, he did a great job explaining the, the fact that this has, you know, it's insensitive to changes, uh, small changes in, in this guy, and therefore, you know, you can get these zero energy modes and there's some instabilities, which various remedies uh, have been proposed. But the whole, you know, idea behind this, we call it correspondence theory and paradynamics, the idea that we can use this collective deformation of, of the bonds within a horizon to then uh, get some kinematic quantity that we can use to evaluate a stress tensor and then, and then just through a correspondence and strain energies, we can develop a relationship between, you know, given that stress tensor and what the corresponding force vector state should be. So this is what we call correspondence theory. So uh, in 2014, Mike Tupac, who works at San Diego, had proposed what he called a generalized correspondence theory, and he had these uh, family of you know, finite deformation strain measures based on like Seth Hill type strains. Um, and he had, he had proposed and called it a generalized theory and a correspondence theory and had shown some results for some cases where it improved the stability over, over the former model. However, it still had some of its own issues with respect to service effects and whatnot. And so we extended that work uh, and came up with this, what we call a, a non-local family of light Cauchy green deformation tensors. It's, it's really just a higher order approximation. Uh, this parameter M, you know, if M is equal to one, this is exactly the the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor, but we can actually plug this into like a Seth Hill type strain measure, one you know one over two m times c to the m minus i, and that'll give us you know basically a Seth Hill family of strains based on this quantity, and then we can you know use use those strain measures in the constitutive models. Uh, so we thought we had done some good work here and wanted to try it out on the Sandia fracture challenge. I guess I have, uh, back up just a second and. Talking about failure modeling. So the most well-known failure model in paradynamics is the so-called critical stretch criterion, which works pretty well for brittle fracture and uh, for certain classes of material models can be related to you know, a strain energy release rate criteria for fracture and other things. But for these correspondence models, it, it doesn't really work so well, it's particularly outside the range of brittle fracture. Um, and so what Tupac had proposed was to, to use like a continuum damage mechanics approach to basically decay the influence. We, we have this influence or weight function in paradynamics, kernel function, and the idea was to compute uh, a scalar quantity that will be stored as a state variable at the node, and we'll then when this stress state is evaluated and distributed to the bonds for integration of the equation of motion, it would decay those bonds in some way. Um, and, and, uh, and so, just basically a way to incorporate continuing damage mechanics into this correspondence model. So uh, for the Sandia Fracture Challenge 3, we, we used uh, this, this type of model for the force vector state based on these uh, right Cauchy green deformation tensors. Uh, it evaluates to this is the force vector state. Um, you, you have this fourth order shape tensor again. It, you know, we, we thought this enhanced the stability properties of the model. But we found out later we were wrong about that. Nevertheless, um, we incorporated it into like a, a, a CMO type framework for uh, doing the uh, doing the plasticity, finite deformation plasticity in a Lagrangian setting. Here's our plasticity model. It's a very simple power law model. 
uh, all of this, there's nothing new here, so I'm going to skip through this really, really quickly. We use a, a Johnson Cook uh, constituent damage model. So uh, that, the Johnson Cook model has you know basically three calibration parameters there. Um, and, and the equivalent uh, effective stress and, and uh, I'm sorry, the equivalent stress and the hydrostatic stresses. Um, nevertheless, this is pretty well known. So again, Sandy Fracture Challenge 3, I think I described it really well. These are, again, the internal uh, features of that sample geometry, and we're asked to predict the low displacement history, the sur surface deformation, <coughs> the, the points labeled P, and the path, the path of crack propagation, as well as the strains along those blue lines. So all of that was asked for prediction. Um, we, uh, we just used Dakota as an optimization framework to model the parameters. So this is uh, from one of the calibration experiments. There is uh, the, the experiment itself, and there's our simulation. So for, in terms of the stress-strain curve for a tensile test, that's our prediction. Or, you know, I'm sorry, that should, that's not a prediction. That's a fit, right? Uh, in the optimization framework, that's you know, solving the inverse problem. That was our fit, but I would say it's a pretty damn good fit. Right? So uh, these were all of the tensile test specimens. There is some variability due to geometry uh, in the Fermi regime, but you know, so this this black line is representative of our simulations um, for the, the pure tensile test, and then for the notch tensile test specimen. Uh, again, there's some variability in the experiments and the black line is representative of our experiments. Um, there's also, there was some DIC measurements of the notch tissel test and we compared those with our simulation too. And then finally, these were the optimized parameters that we use for, again, the power law, hardening model, and the johnson cook damage model. So, this is the results. Uh, or, you know, resulting simulation of the actual geometry, right? So it has those internal features that were made in the, in the added manufacturing process and the crack path view like that. And so comparing, this is the simulation, this is the DIC from the actual model. Um, those aren't on the exact same scale there, but they're close. Uh, you can see the strain contours. This is vertical hinky strain. Uh, in this picture, and this is that complete failure. Those two set are, are on the exact same scale. So you can see the strain contours, the vertical heavy surface strains uh, are, you know, within the view graph norm, pretty good. So our model's valid, right? We, we, we predicted the crack path correct. That's the real experiment crack path. Perfect. Not so fast. Looking at the global load deflection curve, so this is the, you know, the force measured on the load frame, as a function of the gauge displacement. The black lines or the experiment along with the, the bounds or the error bounds on it. And we, we did some also some, uh, we, we introduced some uncertainty in our material properties and ran a num number of simulations. And those uh, orange lines were our predictions. So the view graph norm from the previous slide doesn't tell you a lot when you look at the real details. Uh, we, we did pretty poorly. In fact, we didn't even get the elastic modulus correct, which a little concerning because if you go back to the calibration model, the, the lines are right on top of one another, right? What happened? Here are some of the other measures in the case of the surface strains at those P locations. In all cases, we're, we're a little bit low there. Uh, these are the strains along the vertical lines, uh, the blue lines, so horizontal lines. Again, the black lines are the results of the experiments and the red lines or orange lines are our predictions. In all cases, when you look at the details, it did fairly poorly. Now, now that I have the results, now that I have the results, no problem. I go in there, I put the resulting cal cal calculations into our optimization framework, solve the inverse problem. I can match everything perfectly, right? So having known the results looks great, right? And of course, the, there's a lot of parameters to play with here because you have this transition from plastic strain to damage and when that occurs, when the, that critical failure, the damage model parameters come into play, all that, you know, if you have all of those parameters to play with, you can fit this perfectly. Now, of course, if you, this is meaningless because the elastic modulus is like twice the real elastic modulus of the material, or not twice, but it's, it's significantly different. Uh, as well as, you know, if you were to take the parameters that 
you, you used here to go back to the, to the calibration data, you wouldn't be able to predict those correctly. Uh, this is also just looking at some convergence studies with respect to the horizon, which didn't really turn out to be an issue. So what, what's the source of discrepancy? Well, part of it we really came to realize was just the model had some instabilities in it that weren't thoroughly investigated. Uh, the other issue is, you know, we had very large deformation in this problem before failure. So the original, you know, spherical horizon that you start with by the time failure is initiated is a, is a long ellipsoid. Uh, and in these correspondence models, you have to invert this um, so-called shape tensor uh, and, and become, in the, in the continuum, it's always invertible. But you know, in realistic computations, uh, you, can, you can run into issues associated with inverting that shape tensor. And so um, we, we did some theoretical analysis of the model itself, uh, and we were able to prove that it's actually in, unstable under compression. And while the majority of this problem is in tensile loading, there are some small, because of the geometry, specialized geometry, there are some compressive loads that occur in there. And that was in, you know, exciting an instability in the model, and therefore uh, was causing the issues. And so you know, we were able to identify it theoretically, but also just in a simple experiment. If you have a, a singular bar, which we had a, an analytic solution to, uh, in Tension, the, the, the analytic solution is a red line that's right underneath the black line there. The black line is our simulations. The blue line is the original correspondence theory with no stabilization. So it's, it's the original correspondence theory is unstable uh, in, in this scenario. Uh, and under tension, our model works perfectly. This is another, uh, is a different measure, but also in tension perfectly. But in compression, right, so in the, the red line is the analytic solution in compression. And we get these oscillations. And again, we were able to identify it theoretically. We also see it in the 1D example. And therefore, we, you know, we're seeking to uh, try to fix this. So the instability actually has some origins in the classical Seth Hill strains, but in a less severe manner. So all Seth Hill strains, depending on if the parameter M is positive or negative, are going to have some instability associated with that, um, depending on the choice of nonlinear constituent model, of course. Um, but the non-local operator in our problem exaggerates that problem. And again, even if, you know, that our sample geometry is mostly tensile loaded, but because of the ge geometry in certain areas, there are some compressive loads. And if small, you know, these small in instabilities manifest in sort of wildly oscillating displacements, which immediately let lead to uh, material failure. And it's very hard to elucidate, like what's instability, when you were talking about crack problems, it's very difficult to elucidate what is you know material instability from something that's an actual crack problem. Right? So um, you know again, mo most current energy formulations use a you know a Lagrangian formulation. That is, the bonds are formulated in the in the reference configuration, and then you know everything is all the kinematics are done with respect to the reference configuration. So. What we desire, because again, this issue with inverting the straight tensor and other things, is to use only the current configuration for the kinematics. But we want to track state variables in a Lagrangian way. Again, if we have you know, plastic strain or anything associated with, you know, that, that we want to track with a material point, we want to do that in a Lagrangian way. We just want the kinematics uh, to be done in, in an Eulerian way. We want to use a correspondence material because we want to borrow from this wealth of great constitutional modeling that's done in the classic local theory. And the final thing is we'd really like to use this so-called bond-associated model, which uh, Dr. Medensi did a great job of explaining earlier. And that is, you know, that essentially um, you don't just have a single deformation gradient that's been distributed to all the bonds, but rather each bond has its own deformation gradient, or as you'll see, and what we're proposing is the velocity gradient because we're doing everything in the current configuration. So what we, what we <coughs> are talking about now, we're calling this as a semi-Lagrangian approach. And that is, you know, the, the true Lagrangian, you have your particles and horizon and the reference configuration, and the horizon and the particles deform with the bottom. In the semi-Lagrangian approach, uh, this is the reference configuration, but we're going to reformulate the kernel, even though the, the particles themselves have deformed, we're still going to track state variables with respect to both nodal quantities and bond quantities with respect to the Lagrangian initial position, but 
we're going to formulate the kinematics based on the current position of the horizon, like the current horizon, which will reformulate in the current position every time. So versus, you know, a, a true Hilarion approach, would, the, the particles would stay on the fixed grid, and, you know, that would, like you would use for fluid mechanics or something. Dr. Selwyn Stewart has done some work on a, on a Orla true Eulerian type paradigmatic model for shocks. So now we're going to just, just present the equations of motion. We use a little bit different terminology because, again, we're doing everything in the current configuration. Um, but I think I'll, just in the interest of time, skip through most of this. The most interesting thing is, you know, we're still using this correspondence model. So we have this correspondence and strain energy. We use the energy balance from, uh, to, to come up with that. Basically, what, if you derive the energy balance, what you'll see is you have this term for the total uh, strain energy. And if you compare this then to the classic local quantities, you can come up with a way to determine what this force vector state should be. This is really the, the most important part of the talk, and is that we, we have this proposed velocity gradient. Again, this is just a first order moving least squared approximation to the velocity gradient in, you know, conducted in the current configuration. But here's where things deviate in that we use this to define the so-called bond level velocity gradient or bond associated velocity gradient. And it was inspired by the work of Dio and others on their bond level deformation gradient. Okay, so really just doing things in the current configuration. But here, uh, the one key difference is we actually use, a, we symmetric, symmetricize, uh, is that a word? Symmetricize? Symmet we symmetricize the, the things because ultimately we're going to track basically state quantities on bonds. Damage. Each bond is going to have a damage that's going to evolve over time. And it's important if we're going to do that, that whether we're looking at or determining the velocity gradient from the point x or from the point x prime, it better have the same velocity gradient. And this, symmetric, this symmetricization uh, is what actually allows for that to happen. So every bond has its own velocity gradient, uh, and, but it is the same whether you're looking from you know, point x or x plus x c. You know, on the, whatever end of the bond you're looking at, it has the same velocity gradient. Okay. And, and so that, that is uh, different from the original form, formulation based on different dimension gradients. And so then with this, uh, we can formulate, you know, this is what the, you know, so if we use a Cauchy stress, uh, that's, you know, like a hyperelastic model that's updated uh, uh, based on the, the velocity gradient there, um, or, you know, I guess more specifically would be the rate of deformation tensor, the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. But nevertheless, uh, this is how we come up with the force vector states once the constitutive model is updated. Um, we, we now have a bond level constitutive model update, a bond level damage parameter. Uh, but ex aside from the fact that they're associated with every bond, they follow in a straightforward manner as a classical theory, right? We have a deformation, I mean, we have a velocity gradient, we can update the stress tensor according to some constitutive mo model. And, you know, then we have this damage parameter that's associated with every bond now, again, that is updated uh, according to the damage resolution criteria. And so the, the thing evolves. It's, a, it's not just like the bond breaks. The damage evolves over the deformation history. Okay. Um, here's an example for brittle fracture. So it, just one example uh, just to, sh to, to show how it would work. Um, in this case, if you had some equivalent stress uh, that was defined, the maximum equivalent stress via Tresco or von Mises criteria, once that exceeds some uh, you know, stress critical, you can just set this parameter to zero, uh, otherwise it's one, and, and so it's, you know, this is like bond breakage in the, in the classical critical stretch type of thing. But you can also do something, you know, with respect to brittle fracture, uh, ductile fracture, for example, uh, use the johnson cook model, right? And so here's an example, uh, we did some validation with this theory. Uh, first with Taylor Impact, it's kind of one of the standard validations for plasticity models. This is ones you want to use for dynamic problems. Um, and, you know, the, the, the model matches other models in the, in the uh, literature well as well as experimental results. So, uh, and, and no apparent stabilities, instabilities associated with it. Uh, here's, a, here's a model for using ductal failure. So we just have a hole in the plate. And we picked this because uh, you'll see in the next slide, Stuart did a similar problem where he was talking about the stability of uh, the correspondence models. 
But now you do see the lung deflection curve that you know it decays the force slowly, and this is because the damage per, you know the damage on each bomb is a continuous function, uh, and so you, you do get this sort of softening behavior here. And the nice thing about it uh, with this kind of bond associated model is you get, you know, you're not tracking damage at a, at a node and then distributing it to all the bonds in some uniform way. Um, you know, every bond has its own state variable that's tracked and, and you get very clean fractures, a clean un, you know, unzipping of this. There's no mass loss like you get in <coughs> classical theory where you're using uh, damage mechanics and then maybe element deletion or something like that. So, uh, this is the, just the results, and the reason we picked this problem is because uh, Stewart had this, if you use the classic, or you know, his original formulation with no stabilization, this is important, there's no stabilization on a similar problem, these are strains of plastic, uh, plastic, uh, equivalent plastic strain, and you see you get some non-uniformity and these kind of detached nodes that are flying away, uh, and that's due to the instability. Again, he was talking about a stabilization process for this. Uh, but with no, no, no stabilization, you get a lot of spurious behavior. And then this is our new model, and it you know, seems to behave really well. So with that, let's go back and revisit the Sandy Fracture Challenge, which we did really poorly on with this new model. And I asked Masood, I said, you know, I really want you to do a prediction. Don't, you know, don't, you know, so in the spirit of the original challenge, don't look at the results. Do the calibration, as you would have the first time. Use the calibrated parameters for the challenge to do the prediction. And so, you know, again, you know, same discrete system, same horizon, same calibration data. Um, even though the material was a little bit anisotropic, we just used a high isotropic homogeneous material, with no rate, no temperature dependence. We used the same plasticity model as before, this power law model. Um, we're doing everything in the current configuration, so we, we have to worry about uh, objective stress rates. We just use a co-rotational formulation. That's all standard stuff. Uh, one thing we did actually was, he, he Masood spent the summer doing some data science work and he came back, he actually, he wanted, he wanted to propose to use a simpler model. So the Johnson Cook has three parameters. He actually went to use a, a Jerry Robbins tearing parameter model from Sandia, uh, which actually has two parameters. And, and he told me he thought that the three parameter model led to something that was overfit. That's a, that's a word from data science, uh, you know, from, and I think it's a good word that, that a lot of us can think about when we're doing these type of models. Uh, so he's actually we're using an a, a even simpler damage model than we did in our original prediction. There's one less parameter. Run it through uh, the calibration. There's our, cali you know, so the gray lines are the data, black lines are our, you know, calibrated data uh, simulation one less parameter this time. And here is now the challenge geometry. This is our simulation. So the crack path hasn't changed, right? The crack path isn't what it was, what it was before. Uh, you know, from a visual perspective, it doesn't look like much change. Here are, uh, again, some quantitative uh, comparisons, this time they are plotted on the same scale, vertical Hickey strain. Uh, uh, this was the experiment, this was our simulation, experiment, simulation, okay? And, and then more importantly then is this. So the blue line was our original prediction, prediction, remember. The orange line is our new model, new prediction. Again, without any tweaking, any calibration uh, done, so, you know, it's not perfect. Uh, we definitely could do better, but it's much improved from the previous, from our previous attempt. Uh, this is the total load of deflection curve. Uh, same, th same story for all the surface strains. If you remember all these, you know, again, we're, we're, we're not perfect. We're not even in, in the bounds of the experimental error, but we're much closer. Previously, we, they were very, very low. Um, and, and then if you look along the, along the lines here, this is a hinky strain along these vertical blue lines actually do quite well. Uh, and again, previously uh, they were not even within these, you know, close to, they're all quite low. And uh, so there, there's a happy ending to this story. And uh, I think, you know, we're, we're happy with this model and, and the things that we were able to improve. So, you know, the, we, we did both theoretically and, uh, you know, numerically identify these instability issues with our original formulation. We proposed this new bond-associated simulant Grangian 
uh, constitution correspondence framework. Uh, this is recently published in, um, in uh, uh, what is it published in? JMPS. JMPS, yeah. I couldn't remember the Saul's instruction in JMPS. So uh, JMPS and, uh, and, and as I showed, the, the new model is capable of improving the predictions in, in large deformation problems. And, you know, um, I think I'll end my talk with just, you know, the, the spirit of this workshop is validation, right? And, you know, I, I've been spending the last two years dabbling in, in data science. And I really think that, you know, that they're ahead of us in, in that field in terms of, you know, how they do cross-validation. And I think we can learn a lot from them. And we have to, you know, have that conversation later in the, in the you know, with more detail in the, in the uh, discussion sessions that are allocated in other but if there's any questions about my talk, happy to answer them now. The remaining gap between your simulation results and the experiments results in SXF at C3, do you think they're more attributed to constitutive modeling, damage modeling, or you can't say? I can't say. Uh, we kind of did this, you know, revisit as uh, in fact, we didn't even write a, a full paper on the results of this. We, we just wrote like a brief note, <laughs> and just kind of at, at the end of Masood's work. And um, so we, we didn't probably haven't done enough analysis to answer that question. You know, it, we could go to a, a more complex, you know, damage model or, or plasticity model. You know, the the experimental results clearly have some, a little bit of anisotropy in them, but we don't have any in our model uh, that could contribute to it. Are you using the logarithmic strain for the sectoral measures for your bond stretch of one strain? In in the in the original formulation we were using a, a green and brown strain. This more recent is a hyperelastic model that uses the rate of deformation to update the Cauchy stress. The rate of deformation as a as a surrogate for uh, for uh, strain rate. How did your parameters change when you did the recalibration? You did the recalibration of the new model, right? Yeah. I think if the parameters were the same as the older model, did you have a large variation in those parameters when you did the calibration exercise? The new model versus the old model, or is it the, um, well, we use a different damage model, so they're completely different. The, the elastic properties are exactly the same. I don't know, Masood did the plastic, can you comment on that? Did the plastic parameters, the, the, the sigma zero and the epsilon zero, did those change significantly between them? They should be different. I'm not sure how much. I don't remember exactly now. But the elastic one was also a little higher in this one because I think in the initial attempt. EE e is already different. Right. Yeah. Oh, no. It, the, the problem was that in the first one, it, has, it had instability issue. So if you remember the calibration, linear part was completely flipped, but for the actual challenge problem, it was lower. Sure. Yeah, it's and because then of the already there's a problem in this uh, calibration exercise, seems. I mean, I mean, you do try... Even if I try this one in the first one, it's going to under predict the elastic region. It had to be, I, I think, when I uh, manually like, uh, change, adjust that parameter, it had to be like around 300 to fit that using the first model. Yeah. I think that goes back to my question. If you're using the green strain measure, that is much less stiff than the logarithmic strain measure. But I mean, even for the elastic regime. Yeah. Maybe not. It, 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 I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, well, I believe this, right? I mean, it's three or four out. If, if, if I, any engineer in here tell me what the Young's modus of steel is, 200 GPA, right? Pretty damn good. I'm going to take that as a, as a fit, right? John, I mean, just a comment. So I think if you compare these calibration curves, right, to the, the ones you had earlier, what's interesting here is that the paradynamic results are sort of falling right in the middle of the spread of the experimental results, whereas previously they were, they were falling on the edges. So if you have yeah. previous calibration curves handy, but I mean, the latter ones are what I would expect to see. 
whereas the previous ones to me seemed a little bit yeah. curious that they're falling on, on the, the edge of the yeah, district. On the north and the south of this. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the parameters are quite different. Yeah, yeah, yeah because uh, so in this particular one, for example, if you increase your damage parameter, then the first one you may get like the average, but then that one would be out of the bounds. Like I guess it's because of all mostly because of that instability issue that it was like the best kind of in terms of the because the error was defined to some both both of the general yeah. function is to yeah. get the best fit between both both cal sets of calibration data. Oh, okay, yeah. so perhaps that explains what's going yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. One more and then we'll stop for lunch. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned, uh, what was the ratio in the final simulation of your much better prediction between delta and the uh, grid size? Do you remember? I think about three. About three. Yeah. About three. Just standard. Did you guys try to increase yeah. that? I think we tend to focus more on the actual size, right? I mean, we, we did some actual, looking at the actual size of the horizon, so the, the numerical value of it, right? Uh, and, and as you as you see, it, you know, the, the curves kind of converge, kind of. What is the older model? Yeah. <laughs> this, this is the older model. We, we don't, much closer. Yeah, we don't have an equivalent for part of this for the, for the new model. did you get the ratio of three, about three? For this? Yeah, for the yeah if you keep the ratio to be three and then just uh, reduce the horizon, the curves are going to be much closer. But in the older model, you see that it, it it has huge influence on that. In the newer model, it's not like this. It is still affects that, especially the hardening part. They are almost overlapping. But the fracture part, the asset softening part, maybe they vary a bit. Not not super much. I think we should probably eat some lunch now. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs>